Thanks. Um, okay, now it's recording. I can't see the Q&A, so, but I can see the chat, so somebody's got to tell me to go look at the Q&A, the way the screen is. Um, first off, these slides are all online. They'll be given to you as well. Um, you can see them. It's based on a talk I gave a few months ago at the Kernel Recipes Conference in Paris. It's a really good kernel conference. Um, small bunch of developers. Highly recommended. All the all the talks and slides are online. And um, I'll go from there. This is Trust in the Linux kernel. Um, I'm built on the previous talk. Um, this is going to be a little bit more specific about how our development model works, how we create trust, and how we do testing. Really, this is trust is about testing. So, of course, disclaimer, everything is, this is just me. It has nothing to do with the Linux Foundation. Uh, my contract says they can't tell me what to do and I can't tell them what to do. And that's kind of what this talk is. That's my personal opinion. And as far as personal opinions go, let's talk about the big one in the beginning. Um, open source software is more trustworthy than anything else, than closed source software. Uh, that's been proven by other people. Um, that's been proven by lots of other things. But the main reason it's considered trustworthy is not necessarily that the code is without bugs, or is um, works better, but it's that you can audit it. Somebody can audit it. You can go look and see how it's supposed to work, how it works by looking at the source code and at any point in time. And also most importantly, you can fix it. You can fix it in time. You can go back and look what happened in the past, which is a very important thing. Lots of problems come up and are issues that because you say, oh, somebody three years ago did some bug so-and-so somewhere. And, it's been proven in closed source products that they find out something happened a number of years ago and they think something, it became untrustworthy. Well, what happened really there? You can't really know. If you have the source code, you have the history of all the source code, you can tell. You can go back and look, you can rip it out, you can audit it, and you can fix it. And that's the main thing. And this really came to light into the rest of the world when we had the University of Minnesota episode um, that they, trying to submit some patches were purposely incorrect. And they purposely were incorrect and yet they um, sent correct patches at times. It was a very ironic episode. They lied about their research paper. Um, they did some other different stuff. Um, and it's really basically how not to do research on an open source community. And I gave a big long talk about this. I'm not gonna go through the details. That's my internal rest of these talk. Um, go see that if you're curious about the details. It has a history, walks you through what happened, walks you through what happened after the public announcement, how we audited everything, what's going on now, and how the kernel processes has changed since then for researchers. It's put a little more onus on their work. They have to work more in the public eye. They can't work privately. They can't try and slip stuff into us without telling us what they're doing, which is good because we know what we're doing and we want to work publicly and we want to work together in a community and you don't do research on public communities without telling them that. It's basic, simple as that. Anyway, that's a link to the talk and the slides. Go check that out if you're curious. But the main, main reason, again, is the whole episode proved that you can go back in time and you can audit code based on new information. All of a sudden, we were feeling that patches or changes submitted by a certain group of people were now suspect. Right? Whether that's true or not, we weren't there to judge, but we can now go back and audit to see whether it was true or not. Right? Did they submit bugs? Were these things incorrectly? And it turns out majority of their changes were incorrect. Now, whether that was due to negligence or just not good developers or they're purposely doing wrong things, I'm not going to answer that question. That's up to them. But you can go back and make the decision yourself. And you can audit it, you can rip it out, you can change it, you can do that. And we did that based on new information you can go back in the past. And again, that makes a body of software more trustworthy because new things come about all the time. You wanna be able to go back and audit it and detect that, right? That's just the way things work. That's a good reason. So let's talk about trust. Trust when it comes to Linux. When it came out, the main thing is, this is our license. The license of the kernel is saying, we have no warranty, you don't trust us, right? There is no trust. You should apply no trust to the software that you're given. It is up to you to uh, use it as is, or we give it to you as is, you accept it as is. There's no legal responsibility here. Um, so legally, there is no trust involved, right? It's not that. Well, that's great and that's fine, that's our license, but really we want people to use our code, right? You want people to use the code you write, so we have to give them some kind of assurances that we're doing things in a good way, right? 
So while it is a cop-out, legally, we don't have to provide it. When the University of Minnesota thing came out, lots of people were instant and instantly saying, you have to verify everybody who submits the kernel. You have to know who they are. And you want to track who these people are. And based on who they are, then you can trust them, right? Because you should be able to trust some people and not trust other people. People should be different values of trust. What should you do? Uh, and then that people, that's a normal knee-jerk reaction. You want verification of all your employees, of all your submitters. And that's just wrong. And I'll show you why that's wrong. This is a very naive model or a reaction to a problem that this doesn't solve at all. Let's talk about why this is true. This is our development model. I've given this talk for 20 years now. At the bottom, there's developers. We have a lot of developers. Here's the numbers. 4,600 developers last year, 2021. 1,600 different maintainers for different parts of files or tiny subsystems in the kernel. We have about 350 different, well, trees. I think we have, yeah, 350 different subsystem maintainers. And we have Linus and Andrew, and then everything gets merged into Linux next. This is the way the kernel development model works. That's from also almost 500 different companies. So first off, step back. If you want to verify everybody that you, all developers that you have from 500 different companies for almost 5,000 people every year, how would you do that? What kind of process would be involved there? All different countries, anywhere around the world, what would it be involved? That's impossible. You could probably come up with something. If you want to come up with a process to do this, you would instantly stop all kernel development. So that's not really a good idea to do, try and verification of people. So just the basic proof of identity wouldn't really work. Now you can do key signing and try and verification of trust and whatnot, which we do for our subsystem maintainers. In order to be a subsystem maintainer, you're a verified person, you have a key, you can tell when those people are submitting what they're submitting. Um, Linus takes a pull, assigned pull request from those people. Um, we do at the upper levels have a verification of what, who is what, where it's coming from. So we do have that, but for the, the 4,000, 5,000 people, it's not required. It's not ever a responsibility to do that. So here's okay. our statistics. I'm, yes. Uh, if somebody has a hand up, um, okay. Badal, uh, would you like to unmute yourself and ask the question if you have a question? Looks like we have a few hands up. I don't know if they have questions or they are sure. accidental okay. hand raising. <laughs> no, ma'am. Thank you. We continue. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Greg, sorry about that. Go That's ahead. fine. It might be it's easier to type it in the chat or yes. in the question and answer. That, that way we know it's a real question. Right. Cool. Okay, please interrupt. If you do have questions about this, I'm going to go fast. I have like 55 slides to get through. Um, please interrupt me and talk about this. I'd rather discuss it. It's a much more easier. It's hard to do this a webinar, but questions are good. Cool. Okay, no questions. Um, okay, let's move on. So this was our developers last year. Um, we had 79,000 commits. Um, I live in Europe, so dear decimals are commas, sorry. <laughs> I think I said a few different places in this talk. Um, that was a lot of commits. That was a lot of different commits. And um, a lot of the way we do commits are we mark that this fixes a certain other commit, right? We want to show some identity or some um, this was a bug fix, and here's what we fixed over there in the past. So we have a way of tracking what we fixed when. So 13,000 of those commits were marked as they fixed something previous. So 17% of all our changes that we accept into the kernel are fixes, which is good because, I mean, the rest are new features or just other IDs or other things like that. But that's, so, that's about a normal for fixes for a project. But this is after they've hit our trees. This is after they've been merged into a maintainer's tree, whatnot. So they've gone through our testing. So there's a lot, a lot of stuff that happens way before that these ever hit here. So we do, and I'll talk about how our process works, weed out a lot of stuff way before it gets to this point in time. So this is the seemingly high, but it's also a good representation of testing. The big problem with the general purpose operating system and testing it is it has to work for everybody in all different situations. So we can test only under certain limited situations for my machine, your machine, your device, your product, um, the cow milking machine, the satellite. You can test under those situations, but then you fixes come up for that specific scenario, you get them merged back in. That's the way. So testing for your specific use case is key. 
we can only do so much on our own. Um, this is found, okay, again, after they hit the subsystem tree, but 26% of those 17% were actually issues before Linus did a real release. So we do, the way we do releases is RC1, release candidate one, Linus takes all these merges from all these subsystem maintainers for the past um, three months worth of work in two weeks. And then it's from then bug fixes only for the next five to six to seven weeks. So a lot of times we're fixing things that went into RC1. So that never actually got into a real talk. So our testing processes are catching these. We're seeing build um, regressions in certain situations. We're doing other types of work. And so the number of real fixes for previous kernels is smaller than 17%. You can do the numbers and figure out the math there. That's what we're running at. Whether this is good or bad, nobody's ever really tracked this stuff before. I see the numbers based on what people assume for commercial development, and this is way, way good, much better than that. So that's all I can go by. Um, also, in 2021, 12% of all commits were for problems in older releases, not just the current release. Again, that's the way these things work. So you go back in time, we can look back in time all the way as far as our history goes. So this has always been there. It's not John Corbett on the Linux Weekly News. Um, reports shows fixes and where they come from over time. It's a nice little graph. They're really large from the current kernel and then back down and slower. And there's a tail off and there's a bump at the very end that where fixes have been there for all, basically at the beginning of Git history, which is 2.6.32, I think. No, 16. Anyway, um, it's old. It's really old. That's the way those things work. Um, yes, thanks for the link. That's a good link. Um, so let's talk about who did the work. Everybody would like to see this. I don't think we did a report this past year. These are the people that did the work. These are the people that commit the changes. Um, I say it's necessary. This is quantity, not quality. That being said, there's a lot of good quality in here. Um, and I'll call out some people like Lee Jones and um, Geert and um, oh, Colin all do bug fixes. They're doing regression, or they're doing like cleanups, code fixes um, based on reports, based on automatic testing tools, um, janitorial tasks, they're fixing up warnings, they're fixing up build warnings, they're getting aren't fixes up build warnings for new compiler versions. This is all janitorial good development work to keep a code base solid and work and working well. And then those fixes get propagated back to older kernels so we can build older kernels with new compiler versions. That's a big thing because kernel versions live longer than compiler versions do sometimes. And we keep newer kernels working with old compilers as well. Um, but so a number of our top developers are actually doing bug fixes and bug fixes for tiny things, bug fixes for good stuff. And this is basically who did the work last year. So let's see who's doing the fixes. Some people mark things with fixes, some people don't. Dan, great work. He has a bunch of static analysis tools marks things with fixes and does that aren't again like the work Colin. All these other people did a lot of fixes. These people fixed a lot of stuff. These were commits that were merged for that. The percentages, the overall percentages of all the commits in the kernel for that year. So if you go back and look, so Christoph, the number one contributor to the kernel, only did 1.2% of all the contributions. So it's a big curve, the way things work. It's a very healthy curve. We have a very vibrant and healthy community. Uh, we're very, very lucky as far as open source communities go. Our community is huge. Um, we're very happy. It keeps growing. We're very, very pleased. It's working well. This is a good sign of a solid, good community. So again, top fixes. So then I went back and I said, okay, who are these people fixing bugs for, right? And um, no, that's French, but okay, there's English. Um, I don't want to call these people out. Everybody writes them. Um, but I will say that a number of the people in the top 10 contributors that fixed or had things fixed are our core developers. And that only makes sense if you think about it. The number of people who, the more code you write, the more bugs you write. It's a percentage of the quantity of what you do. So if we were to try and prevent our people who write the most bugs from contributing to the kernel, we would, we would stop contributions from our most prolific and most trusted developers. And again, the idea of you need to know who is your developers. We know who the developers are. You can look, these statistics are there for everybody. Who writes the most bugs? You can look, our most prolific developers. I write a lot of bugs because I've written a lot of code. It's a percentage wise, right? 
am I a bad developer? No. Am I here to fix the bugs I'm reporting? Yes. And that's the key. That's a trusted developer, somebody who's going to be there to fix this. And I'll talk about this a little bit more. But again, the idea that you should try and keep people who have a history of writing bugs out is not necessarily a good idea. Now you can look at percentages, you can argue percentages and whatnot, but that just does not work. Okay, we're all human, we all make mistakes. I make mistakes. I've written a lot of fun security bugs. I fixed a lot of security bugs. Maybe I'm hopefully one more than the other. Who knows? Again, you can't keep people out that way. So again, the most prolific developers for any project, closed, open, anything, will write the most bugs. People forget this. That's just the way it works. That's kind of fun. Um, so to think that you can find out who is trusted and who isn't, your most trusted people are writing the most bugs. So, so much for that model. So what do we do? The idea to solve this is to make it easy to find them and to fix them. That's the goal. Because everybody's going to make mistakes. Everybody's going to find problems. You want to make, I want you to find my bugs. I want our infrastructure to find the bugs I write. And I want the infrastructure to find the bugs you write. And if we make that easy to find these bugs and fix these bugs simply, then that prevents malicious or unintentionally malicious, because you can't tell the term between the two, problems from getting in. And it's as simple as that. It makes the project healthier and work better for everybody if you make bugs easier to find and fix. So let's talk about life cycle of a kernel change. Uh, first, is there any other questions on this? No more questions, Greg. There were okay. a few other questions I, I answered. Um, okay, cool, thanks. Um, yes, those are good links. How all the maintainers are, we have tools. Um, so let's talk about life cycle of a kernel change. So a lot of people don't seem to understand this, how patches actually get into the kernel, what steps they go along the way. They see from one point of view or one, another point of view or just all big black box. Let's talk about this. This is gonna walk you through it all. So first thing, email. Submit through email, send a patch, that's it. We have tools to help create a patch. We have tools to help send a patch. Email is the lowest barrier of entry from anybody in the world. There's no, it's all done in public. We have no central authority where you have to log in or not log in and keep an identity. None of that's there. We can verify it. People don't realize that our patches that we send through email are verified. You can, they're cryptographically signed. My patches that I send out, you can verify that I sent them. Or the person owned that has the key by me sent those patches. Email works great for this. We verify them. I do verify them. I verify when you send them out that you actually really sent them from the correct domain. Um, the employer domain works, things like that. We verify the patches when they come in. Email works wonderful. It's the lowest bar possible barrier to entry. I don't think we can get it even lower. Everybody's like, oh, you want GitHub and stuff. Well, GitHub has a long, arduous process to sign up for uh, an account, right? Not all countries can sign up for GitHub accounts. There's also legal issues, ramifications like that. Email, send us an email, away we go. You can't send a known anonymous, anonymous patch. Other than that, send it to us, very simple. Um, we review this stuff in public on the mailing list and either we reject it, well, we usually reject it. <laughs> Most all changes are rejected. Um, you can also see the status of things through password tools we have or some subsystems for the whole kernel. We have those types of things. You can see what's going on with that. Um, and that's the way things work. One third, no, a patch takes, I think I'll talk about this some more, at least three times to get through merge to that. Because again, you're gonna have to resubmit it based on the review. Resubmit it again through email, talk about how you document what changed from the previous one, because like some people like me get a thousand emails a day, you need to do something with them. Other maintainers have smaller numbers, like. The networking people get a ton of patches. You need to say what changed from the previous one because I don't remember. I was that was twenty that was two hundred patches ago, um, and then we can go from there. Our tools show this also as well, uh, but properly document them, which is a good indication that you knew what you were changing and you took everybody's review comments into effect. Document it. It's all plain text, simple editor. Pick whatever editor you want. When I'm not picky, you can use Git to do all this stuff or not. A lot of people still don't use Git. It's up to you. We don't force any use of any specific tool that way, except any random email client. That's all you need to do. Resend it. And again, average at change takes about three attempts. This is based on numbers, some subsystems I work on, the driver core, USB, TTY, serial, even staging, cleanup patches take about three times to get right sometimes. 
Um, this isn't the number, some go through right away, um, easier to develop, some developers are more experienced, some even more. I looked on the list today, I see some, which is on version 25 of the patch series. I think we've gone up to 52 in, in some times. I think there's some big, um, there's some CPU um, bug series or some CPU ser feature series that was on like in the 50s or 60s. Um, it took a couple of years. That's just the way they work. Um, it's nothing out of the ordinary to keep it ongoing and it just that just happens review happens as it goes you want us to reject patches that aren't correct so take the review process as it is keep on moving forward every and then this is the thing that people don't realize every time you email it bots run on this thing we have testing that runs on the system and if those emails uh, if those changes or those bots find problems They'll just automatically reject it. I mean, me as a maintainer, I love seeing messages like this. This is an example message that just came across um, from the kernel test robot that said, hey, Johan, um, this kind of caused some problems. There it is. As a maintainer, I can go, okay, great, there's a problem. I don't even have to worry about this review. It needs to be fixed. He'll take care of it. It will go on from there. Um, sometimes these are wrong. There's all the information in there. Um, but your tests, your patches are run on these bots and they automatically run so you'll start seeing sometimes there's a delay a day or two or sometimes um sometimes reviewers get to them faster point things out before the bot can but everything you send to the public gets tested instant on its own automatically and people don't realize that we are testing and i'll show you what we test these things for it's a lot and this is the kernel zero day bot intel runs this thing um they say it's, it provides a one hour response time that's comes and goes depending on how the model is working how the review process is going and what their back end is doing at the moment every patch is tested all of the all goes along test the covers the branches of the developer tree when i merge stuff into my tree it also tests it i'll talk about that as well so even after accept things it'll also retest it and then i don't let, allow those to move on to the next stage unless it passes those tests because sometimes i'll take things before i went through the email the email response and sometimes i'll take things and they'll interact with other things that i previously have taken that the bot couldn't have thought, things like that uh, build stack, a bunch of static analysis tools um, it's listed on the web page what they support and also when the things fail they'll start bisecting things so with, in a tree that um like the stable trees that they're old and things like that it'll start saying it'll start running new tests and say hey there's a problem somewhere it'll bisect down and say here's the problem at this commit email everybody involved and the way it goes and it also does performance testing. It tests benchmarks. Um, the, merch, the memory management and the I.O. subsystem, you'll see some emails that go out to the mailing list saying, I saw a regression of X percentage on this benchmark with this patch set. And you're going, okay, why? And then you need to work on that. And sometimes they'll bisect it down. This is really good stuff. This is stuff being pulled from the mailing list. This is pull, stuff pulled in our developer trees. It works. Really, really good testing. This weeds out probably 90% of the most obvious problems as it is. Look on the mailing list, you'll see this bot just turning away and responding to things. It's a wonderful thing, great tool. Intel does a great job on this thing. We're very, very happy with it. They keep adding more tests. You can add tests to it. You can say, please sign up my development tree to it. So you know, have it run on your tree before you send it off to the public. It'll do that for you. It does a great thing. You can add lots of stuff. They run a lot of tests too. I couldn't say how many. So. On the bottom here, all the developers, the zero day bot runs on everything that's sent publicly. Again, that's why we send work publicly. You can see who gets things sent or who sends what in public and then the tests happen in public. That's how we do good stuff. Then let's keep on going. Say me as a maintainer, I accept it. Looks good, I'll add it to my tree. Then the real testing starts. Zero day does a good, a good amount of testing, but there's a bunch of tools that we have that starts kicking in in the background that really starts doing really good work. Um, the big one that runs is kernel CI and zero day. Zero day again runs on our developer trees, all these on the blue line, all these subsystem maintainer trees, we have about 350 of them. Um, they start churning away on this stuff when, they, when we push them out. Um, emails us as, if things are good or bad. Kernel CI also runs on these trees and starts reporting things and starts really finding problems. And kernel CI is great. Kernel CI is um, uh, now a Linux Foundation project started by um, embedded number of embedded developers. Um, and it's community led. It's um, run by a whole bunch of different companies are contributing as well. You can contribute. 
Um, all the tests are open, all the infrastructure is open, and um, it allows all of us to test in one, in a way, just like we do development, all in the open, all together collaboratively, contributing to a common set of um, end goals, right? So the kernel um, community, me as a maintainer, I don't want to have to go test or look at 5, 10, 15 different trees or different locations on the web to find out what happened, if, if these trees are good or not. I don't want you emailing me five, six different reports from different subsystems or different tools to see if it worked or not. Just give me one. Kernel CI is a conglomeration of hopefully in the end, all the really good testing and all the really good way to do this stuff. Um, right now we're tracking 62 different branches of different kernel development trees. It's doing what, 13,000 different build and boot tests on, on real machines, all real machines all around the world. There's a whole bunch of architectures doing it. Um, Microsoft and Google um, offer up a bunch of build uh, in the cloud. So we do the builds up there in the cloud, send them down to the devices, test, build, boot, run some tests. They're added, trying to add more tests to, after you boot uh, and then it reports back to the systems and then it can go and write some all of them. Makes a little pretty report. You can click on them online. You can see the current dashboard there, um, see what the current state of everything is. Um, but the neat thing is it's all real devices. Some are embedded or some are emulated, but these are real devices out there in the real world. They're being tested, your devices, you can add a lab to it. People like all of a sudden we got a whole bunch more devices showed up and we're like, what happened? And it was a lab from a company in I think Europe just added, okay, now we're gonna start pushing out our tests publicly. You can hook up your stuff to it, it works really good. I'm very happy to see that. This is really good. If you have a device that runs Linux and you wanna make sure all the future kernels run on it, add it to this, you know? You can add your own device to the system Keep it going, and then that makes you now get reports based on if the latest kernel and the latest development trees are having problems or not. It's a really, really good thing. You don't want it to break. We don't want it to break your system. Now we can have an early warning system. This is what happens. These are really good uh, stuff. Greg, if I may, you can yes. also go in and submit your own tests. They will look through, uh, through the kernel CI GitHub process. They will add those tests once they review and add them. So that is also possible with the kernel CI. And so that is true with uh, ZeroBot as well. You can always request more tests to be added. Uh, yes. The people that maintain those rings will uh, look through all the tests and add them for you. So you can add devices and tests for yes. those. Yes, oh, that's a really good point. Yeah, both types of stuff. And as she was the maintainer of the testing subsystem, as more tests are accepted by her into the kernel itself, those automatically gets run by these tests, <laughs> these systems which is really good because then sometimes it finds problems with older kernels. We have newer tests added, we find problems with older kernels, we fix them, we move on. Um, so get your tests to the kernel tree itself right. or a number or so. Um, there's other file systems tests are in a different package, you know, other things, but the number of networking, number of BPF is a large, we have a huge number of tests now, right? Um, yeah, so get your tests into the kernel tree. Very good. Um, cool, yeah. And also the nice thing about the kernel CI is doing it is there, created a common way to report tests or report things that happened. So, because when you have tests coming in from different testing systems, you want to be able to conglomerate them in one spot. They've created the framework, um, Google and Red Hat. I think the SysBot tests now contribute to this. Red Hat's been doing some CI testing on the upstream kernels, which is good. And that feeds into there. And of course, all the kernel CI stuff feeds into there. So again, it's one unified location that we can see all the results of all the other stuff. Um, there's some more effort going on in here to get other groups involved and to participate. I think they're trying to feed the zero day stuff into there. I think that might be done soon. Um, and um, there's a few other external testing companies and stuff. And I'll talk some more about how the stable kernels are tested. There's a lot of other stuff happening there. Um, and they're going to eventually feed into the kernel CI stuff. Ideally, I just get one report, kernel CI, all, any maintainer gets it. Here's all the problems from all the different, all the different testing systems. And we go from there because that's the goal here. We want to make it all unified. So that's a lot of tests. 13,000 tests run on your changes all the time, every day. And then when they get to Linus or when they get to Andrew Morton and Linux Next. So Linux Next is, happens every day. It merges all our different subsystems together. That's what's going to go to Linus on this next release, not the current one. And so kernel zero day runs on that. Kernel CI runs on that. Gunter and LKFT run on that as well. LKFT, um, so this, all these changes merge together. And so it's a, it's a common area that we can all agree is going to be what is gonna happen next. It's a good place to test um, independent of the subsystems as well. If you're a testing system, it's easier to test that. 
And LKFT is um, from Lunaro, uh, Linux kernel functional testing. It's, I wish it was more with kernel CI. Currently it's independent. They're working to tie, try and bring it back together. But right now, Lunaro is sponsoring this and the member companies in Lunaro are sponsoring this. So you can't really look a gift horse in the mouth. Um, they're doing a lot of really good testing for me in the stable releases. Uh, Linus's RC releases now will run through this. I think um, Linux Next is also on a daily basis is run on this stuff. Um, there's a tool called Tech Suite. Um, you can click on that and see it's a Perl or it's a Python testing framework that you can submit jobs to the system and get it back. It's all open source. Uh, I think you can even run it on your own back end if you really want. The cool thing is there's a lot of testing in there and it does a lot of build and a lot of a lot of permutations of all this stuff automatically. 125,000 tests are being run currently on these things. Um, quantity isn't everything, quality matters. There's a lot of stuff in there that's happening. It's doing build and boot and test functional testing after the boot happens. Um, it's not doing all architectures. It's doing a subset of architectures and it's doing a subset of configs and a subset of compilers. So it does test a few different compilers, like all the Clang, Clang developers are using that to make sure things keep on working well and that's doing really good stuff for them. Um, it's not everything. It's not as much as like some of the other testing systems, but it's something and we're happy about that. And then Gunter's, Gunter's a, a subsystem maintainer of a driver subsystem, the kernel. He's been doing this on his own for quite a while. Um, and he has his own test spot build system that is public. You can um, download it. Um, he made it available for everybody else. I know some of uh, the other people are running it locally. Um, he actually builds all architectures that the kernel supports, which is awesome. And that's really good. Um, yeah, I think he's the only one that does that. Um, and he boots them on all architectures that the kernel supports using QEMU, not on native machines, but emulated. And that actually finds a lot of problems that we wouldn't be able to find otherwise. A lot of build problems on odd architectures, a lot of build problems on some really funky old configurations and boot time on configuration and systems that we don't have elsewhere. Um, even though it's emulated, it's a really good test. Um, he's found more problems in like the old ARM32 code than anybody else. Um, he, he beats the PowerPC people by testing when they have their own tests on the, the real systems. Um, it's invaluable for all the stable testing, but those are running on Linux's tree, on um, Linux Next on a daily basis, and all the release candidates that come out for the stable releases. Um, really, really good testing. I couldn't do that without it. Um, he runs it at a certain time at night due to cheaper power where he lives in California. Um, hopefully he gets some, somebody to sponsor that someday, but it's a really good system. So again, zero day kernel CI, LKFT and Gunter are running on this all the time, 24 hours a day, all the time. So this is how we feel assured that you should be able to trust us. These testing is all done in the public. Testing is done and communicated to us if we have problems. If things hit Linus's tree, and then it even goes out and more people test them. The only, I don't test Linus's tree, I test my subsystem tree, right? And I test my subsystem tree, merge with Linus's tree, so then I'll see different bugs that might happen that way. Um, that's how things work. And then you find a problem and it interacts and then go from there. So our number of bugs found even before it hits the subsystem tree is huge as the other testing is found. Linus's tree is, and then we go on and then we go on from there. And also big thought time is we're seeing more and more subsystems come through and say, hey, thanks for the bug fix. Can you also write us a test at the same time? I saw that yesterday for um, a really weird, nasty um, CPU architecture issue. They're like, okay, great. We'll take this only if you submit a test too. So they added a test to the framework. Framework was easy. We have a standardized framework that Shua maintains. It's really simple to use. I've written tests for it um, and it gets out of there. And then we make sure that bug can never come back. And that's the key. You don't want a regression. Don't want to have a way to do that. So submit a bug fix, submit a fix uh, for a test, and away you go. It's hard to write tests for drivers that with specific hardware. That being said, there are driver subsystems that have tests. The um, DRM, the graphics driver subsystem, they have whole emulators of emulated um, GPUs and whatnot and frameworks that they run that I don't even talk about here at all because they have a whole separate testing infrastructure and framework and dashboard that they run everything through. And if you ever submit a patch to it, you'll start getting automatic responses and tell you go look here and what happened there and how that goes. Um, they do a ton of work in that way and they can emulate devices. Those people, there's some other work being happening so that you can emulate other devices in Python and user space tools. And we'll eventually roll those into the kernel itself as well. So we can test virtual devices. Again, you go and test virtual devices. Isn't always, sometimes there's bugs in hardware, as you know, so then you have to emulate the bugs in the, your model in order to get your driver to work properly. It's tricky that way, but we're dealing with hardware. So that 
hopefully should give people an idea of how, how we test. And then also let's talk about the stable kernels really briefly. Stable kernels happen this way. Uh, my branch, I take a patch, I, I take Linus's tree and start doing stable releases. The rule of that, the fix has to be in Linus's tree before we go to the stable kernel. I do a release candidate and I do about once a, month, once a week for a different number of kernels that I'm maintaining at a time. And then I get reports back. So I get reports, even more reports than Linus's stuff happens. Hopefully that'll switch over time. Again, Kernel CI, Gunter, Shua, that's our own testing. The Android um, systems start kicking off and, and report back bugs to me. Um, Huawei does a bunch of testing. NVIDIA does a bunch of testing. Debian, Fedora. And there's a number of other um, chip companies that send me private reports after, usually after the merge come out saying, hey, everything's working good. I get some, one company sends me something once a month saying everything looks good. Or no, hey, there's a problem over here. And they bicycle down to that fetch. This has a problem here. Can you look at that? Which is great. If you don't want to um, post things publicly, you don't have to, but it's nice if you do. But for stable um, kernel releases, it's really good to know that you're testing the stuff and verifying that things work properly. That's really, we have a lot of testing happen. And when we do the releases, uh, you can see all the tested by, by the different groups. That's all the that matters. Greg, there is a question in the yes. Q&A box. Um, how soon have zero day vulnerabilities in stable kernels been patched in the past? And is there a page maintained to confirm perversion vulnerabilities? Um, so zero day stuff, meaning we got the fix as soon as, or we got a report and we fixed it today. Um, if you look at how the kernel does security issues, we treat a bug as a bug as a bug. Um, we don't call out security issues per se to uh, to the public. So we fix things. Also, a lot of the times we fix things because we don't realize there's a security issue or not. We fix it and we move on. So we fix it, merge into Linux's tree, merge into stable trees, push it out and move on. We don't deal with CVEs. I gave a whole talk about how CVEs don't work with the kernel. Mitra, uh, the CVE organization um, from the US government agrees that the kernel's kernel doesn't work well for CVEs and say, don't, they don't even give me CVEs anymore. Um, so we don't track. We don't track these things. We don't um, have a page per version of what is fixed, what not. We have open change locks. So what I do say is we fix things before people realize that they were a problem. The Android, the Google team, a number of years ago did a, a research and they said every single one of the reported vulnerabilities that they found were fixed in the stable kernel before they were made public. And that's what's happening. So we fix things every week before we even realize they're a problem either on purpose or because we can't tell you, get them update and roll out. So always take the latest stable kernels. That's my root mantra. We're fixing things in there all the time. If you're not using the latest stable kernel, um, you have a vulnerable system. I'll tell you that. I completely agree with that. So the easiest way to maintain that you're, to understand that you're up to date and you have patches for all the latest known problems is to use the latest kernel. It's as simple as that. We have to guarantee that we're not gonna break user space you should have systems in place that you can test the latest kernel or any kernel update, be it a one-line fix, be it a major upgrade to a different new version, it should be the same process for you. Push it out and go. Um, Android has the latest upstream LTS kernel available for all devices in the world, um, usually within a day or two. Um, you should be pulling from there. Um, if you're relying on Android, it has all the stable stuff in there as well. Um, if you're a distro, a number of good distros do this well. Fedora does this amazingly well. Debian, amazingly well. The majority of the world runs on Debian systems. Um, everybody doesn't seem to realize that, but I think it's huge, huge quantity is Debian system. Uh, Fedora, Arch, OpenSUSE does it. Um, SUSE Enterprise backwards bits and pieces. Uh, RHEL doesn't backward anything at all. Um, that's me arguing with RHEL people. You talk, you talk to them and have them justify their, their reason why they don't take that fix. But um, yes, so just take the latest stable kernel and that's it. And you're guaranteed of all the fixes that we know about. Thank you, Greg. Sorry, that was a rant. I've given whole talks on this thing before. <laughs> that's good information. Cool. Um, okay, so trust in us and our development process is we trust you, so it's patched, but we verify that the change works properly. It's the only thing we can do, trust but verify and trust and test. And that's what you, I want my tests for my patches that I submit to be tested and proven that other people can trust. Not only that who sent it, which who sent it doesn't really matter as we've come out to see, um, but trust that it tested and got it right. But it also trusts who sent it in that 
the real trust model in the kernel, and I've always alluded to this in different talks, is that we're only, I trust, I will take changes from a number of people. Okay, it's from these people, great, wonderful. I trust that, not necessarily that they got it right, because we're all getting things wrong, but they'll be there to fix it when they get it wrong, because we all get it wrong. We're human, we're fallible, we all make mistakes, we all don't know how things work at times, we all make just foolish mistakes. And we're hope, and if I trust that you're gonna be there to fix it, when it goes wrong, that's the ultimate trust model. That is the Linux kernel development trust model, that you have the ability to fix the problem when it comes up. And that's that's how things work. And that's it. That was fast. Wow, I've burned through this. 45 minutes. Um, cool. Questions, comments, heckles. There is a question in the question and oh, answer cool. box. And I'll read that. If we use, if we use the latest kernel sometimes, oh yeah, I can read okay. this, sorry. Okay. <laughs> if, we, if we use okay. the latest Linux kernel, sometimes the distribution of Linux patches do not apply. How to fix that? Um, number one, you don't have to use Linux distribution patches. <laughs> um, you should be able to run a stock kernel.org kernel on your system without any distribution patches. Um, that being said, it does, you can just merge them in. Um, there's, very good ways of doing patch management, merging things in, using Quilt, using Git. Um, it can be done. Um, sometimes it gets complex depending on how the, these outer tree patches for the developer develop. Sorry, the distribution are, but I would push back on the distribution and say, why aren't you getting your changes upstream? Why am I relying on you to do this work? Why has this been rejected by the community? Why is this not upstream? We found a number of problems in some distributions with out of tree patches that were never submitted upstream and that were proven to be vulnerable. Um, you want the review of the kernel community. So get them upstream. So push back on your distribution. If your distribution requires that or says that, switch distributions. There's no way forcing you to any, use any distribution. You never forced to use anything like that. There's lots of other good distributions out there. I'll call, call out Debian, great, great work. Fedora, OpenSUSE, Arch. And embedded wise, use Android. All the Android kernels are right there for you. Android even merges into your, your vendor SOC mess, and those merge in and build and boot just fine. That's tested on a weekly basis. There's no reason you shouldn't be using the Android common kernel for Android and meta devices. Ah, it's just right there. Um, what body of work I see sponsored? Um, kernel development is sponsored. I mean, we all work for companies. The old joke used to be you send five patches to the kernel and you get a job. It's not an old joke. We all are sponsored to do this type of work. Um, I would like to see more companies um, help provide the testing infrastructure. More companies work with Kernel CI and help them out to do that. Um, it can be just as simple as start sending your test results to Kernel CI. If you're doing the testing anyway, start using it. If the, if the interchange that we have for the, for the format for test results isn't correct, work on it. Help us out. Um, we're glad to detect and do that type of stuff. So. That's a, as far as development, I mean, everybody contributes to the kernel in a selfish way, and that's fine. That's what we want that. You're contributing to the kernel because you had a problem and you want to see it solved in a certain way. That's good because it turns out everybody has the same problems. I call out the old adage of power management. The embedded people said we're special and unique and we have to take this in a special way. We said, no, do it generically. It got merged, everybody accepted. Your devices work great for power management and data centers save billions of dollars in power thanks to the power management. It works for supercomputers. It's just as good as embedded. We all have the same problems. They're not. We're all special and unique people, just like everybody else. Um, okay. Um, what drink am I drinking? I'm drinking wine, uh, water right now. It's too early for wine. I do live in Europe. Um, oh, academics. So, academic. I've had a lot of work in this recently. One reason I moved to Europe was because of academics. I worked with a university in Paris. Um, there's a lot of applied research development happening out there, and a lot of it gets merged into the kernel. A lot of groups, a lot of people do understand this. Julia Lul has fixed more security bugs than anybody in the world. And the kernel, thanks to the work she did in academia, she's a professor, and the tool that she created, Coconel, that we use to do static analysis and fix those bugs. Um, that is applied research 
very good stuff in the kernel, works really well. The real-time ch operating system changes came from academia. It was an interaction of academia and industry and kernel developers knowing how to work on this stuff together. Tons of papers were published on it. It was all and merged into the tree. And lost it. And so academic work happens really well. I live now in the Netherlands. Right up the road here is uh, the academics who found Spectre and Meltdown and found Redbleed. <laughs> And found other types of security stuff. They're doing hardware security analysis of CPUs and how that affects the kernel. We work with that type of work. We fix the problems up and we go on from there. Um, they do a lot of operating system research there. They do operating system research in other parts of this country um, in academia. So it's really good. There's a number of universities in the US that do this as well. Other developers interact with them. Uh, so it happens a lot. Um, I'm very happy to see that a lot of research um, is not happen that way. If somebody wants to just publish a paper and run away, I'm, I appreciate the research that wants to publish a paper, work with the community, get it accepted, and do that. And then um, see their ideas actually used in a, a real way. I, I like those kind of groups, and I enjoy working with them, and I do that a lot. And it's fun to talk to the students about that as well, because then they always usually get good, good jobs. <laughs> That's always fun. So it's not a quantity. It happens a lot. You have to look at the specifics. Anything else? There's 300 people. That was a very few number of questions. Oh, mailing list is very high volume. That's a so <laughs> the um, nobody reads the mailing list. All the mailing lists. <laughs> There's the links kernel mailing list, so we all send things. It's a write only type medium. We all filter. We all read the subsystem mailing list for that we're interested in. I read a number of subsystem mailing lists, and they're easy to keep up with. Uh, find the area of the kernel that you're interested in and uh, join that mailing list. We have, I don't know, 50 different mailing lists, 60. Um, and just participate in that. Read other people's work that's coming by. That's so something that you are interested in. If you care about USB patches, watch the USB mailing list. If you care about networking patches, uh, the networking mailing list is quite high volume. Care about BPF. I've actually, BPF is right on the edge of being able to read everything, but you can keep up with that and see what's happening up there. Um, so yeah, so don't, don't rely on digest, just subscribe to the subsystem mailing list that you care about. There's also, we have really cool tools with lore.kernel.org and we have tools that you can uh, set up a filter and say, give me everything to sign like those Greg writes and it'll show up in your inbox. You run a tool that says, give me anything that has USB in the subject line or that touches this file in the kernel and it dumps it out of the mailbox format and you read it from there and you can watch that feed. So we have really good ways to filter those feeds and do that. Or you can leave Linux kernel as a read only thing and you can go back and look at things in the past. A lot of us do it that way. That's really a good way to do that. But don't, don't think you have to read all Linux kernel mail lists. We don't, none of us do that. It doesn't happen. Um, does the pat how does the patch rejection rate affect contributions? Um, you tell me. We our contribution rate has been constant and constantly going up for the past 27, no, 30 years. Um, every year we're like, there's no way we can possibly go this fast again, and we do. These are accepted patches. Again, remember, uh, average of at least takes three times to get a patch submitted before it gets accepted. Um, if we were to cut our accepted patch rate into a quarter we still would be going faster than anybody else. It's still a huge number of what we're doing. So patch rejection, you want patches that are buggy or that have problems to be rejected. Why do you not want that? I just said, the development re review process of the kernel is hard. It's difficult, but it's also really good. I, a core contributor a long time ago said when he first started off, it's the scariest thing he ever did was contributing to the kernel because now it's in your name. And when things are in your name, you actually take more care, you take more pride in it because it's going to be on your, it's like, this is going to be on my, my permanent record for the rest of my life. And it's true, but it's, it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to do this type of stuff, learn from it and contribute. My first contribution was like, here's a driver. And they're like, oh, this is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. And have you ever heard of this thing called multiprocessor? I'm like what? So yes, it's really good. It's a great review process. Peer review works really, really well. On average, when you take a vendor driver and get it submitted to the kernel and finally accepted, it's one third the size. We have some very documented drivers that were added eventually when they went through the review process. One third the size means one third of the possible number of bugs. And a lot of these have increased functionality with decreased code size. Development process works so far. So we have not had a problem with patch rejection. Yes, don't take it personally. 
we're just reviewing your code. Nobody should ever compare or complain about you as a developer. We're just critiquing code. That's what you're supposed to do. It's really good to learn. Start reading the mail list and read other people's code. You learn how to read music before you write music, right? You need to learn how to read code before you write code. Do that. Review other people's stuff. See where problems are happening. And then that's the best way to learn. A good way to do that. Do I think there's a need for more kernel developers? Um, I don't think that there's a need for less. <laughs> um, but you tell me. I, I, there's a, a company um, somebody I used to work for a long time ago always every year would jokingly ask me, hey, is the kernel finished yet? Why aren't you done? And then I never had a good answer until finally I realized that it's done when you stop making new hardware. And that's as simple as that. They stop making new hardware, stop having new use cases, stop needing a general uh, operating system to control all these different things. The kernel is just a tool. It's a hammer to make somebody else solve the problems that they need. Then we finish. And that's not going to happen because the world constantly changes. So there's always going to be new, more developers. We'll always gladly accept developers. It's a wonderful thing. Contribute to the kernel, get a job doing this stuff, work for companies do this stuff. It's it's a really, really good thing. So yes, always be more kernel developers. Um, bum, 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 bum. Cochinelle, I think um, Shua mentioned that. Already okay. Do I think a test-driven development for Linux kernel? We have test-driven development for Linux kernel. You can write your tests, submit them. We have unit tests in there. Wonderful thing. Please do it if you want to do it. I'm not forcing you to do it. You can do it today. So if you like that development model, wonderful. Do it. It's a little hard for some types of things. Some types of things it's impossible. Some types of things it works really, really well. Um, a number of subsystems require it. It's, it's that simple. So it depends on the area of the kernel that you're working. On. Yes, that's good. Um, how many small uh, NSA can come to the ship talk later? Find out. Um, no known security holes have been added by anybody, but there's been lots of unknown security holes added by regular developers. Again, as I said, I've written security holes and not mean it, right? It's hard to um, know malicious intent, right? We do have not have any examples of known malicious attempt to get a hole into the current. So, simple as that. I will document that. Um, it's as simple as that. Is there a deadline of new equipment cures? How quickly would drivers be introduced? There is no deadline. We take drivers and code for hardware that isn't public. Infamously, we ripped out code for a whole processor from Intel. And we're like, wait, 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 somebody must have this hardware. We can't delete this code. And Intel said, no, that was actually never, that chip never shipped. So Intel is so far out of the game, they have patches reviewed developed, reviewed, accepted, merged, released before they even had a chip that came out of uh, out of their validation area and then they ended up not doing it. So you can have stuff merged today for stuff that isn't public yet. Fine. If you other companies rely on a public announcement before they start sending patches, that, then they're constantly behind the ball. Qualcomm is known for this. They, submit a new, they create a new device, announce it, then they start sending patches, and three years later, they're all merged. But in the meantime, they've already created a new a couple of new devices that so are always behind the behind the wall. That's their they want to do that. That's up to them. Intel does it better. IBM does it really well. I think they were booting Power 5 on the Linus's kernel with like four changes once in a brand new CPU architecture because it all just worked in the validation. So how quickly for drivers again it depends on the subsystem and depends on the hardware. But we'll take them today. We have no requirement for that. Um, yes, the US government wants to understand the most important software on earth, of course. So talk to us. We're not hidden. We're actually, we are all working public. People write research subjects on this. We documented how we do, how the kernel security team works. We got documented how the model works. We document all this type of stuff. Great. Um, provide another report. Um, I hope they talk to me because I do kinds of this work. Um, so yeah. Um, I don't think it is not going to stop whether people are allowed to contribute or not at all, because even if you look at the last time the US government forbid certain countries or entities from contributing to um, companies or contributing or being bought by, it turns out open source is not forbidden because it's all done in public, it's not behind any contractual obligations, it's not behind any mon monetary things, whatnot. You cannot legislate around that. Um, so that's actually turned out the open source works better for everybody in the world because of that, because that not any one random rogue country can for, can try and stop it that way. It just can't happen. Um, so it turns out our development model actually routes around um, governments because of that. 
Um, yeah, and we're not going to validate who. I mean, we know everybody knows who contributes. Um, harsh environment, widespread or isolated situations. Um, I think a number of people in the past had a bad view of harsh environment. Um, that hopefully has been since we changed the last code of conduct, which is four years ago. We have not had any reports of that. Uh, the code of conduct committee does a report every six months or so saying what's there's been any issues or not. Um, so far, there's been no issues really. Um, so I can do that. Um, I always find the harsh comments interesting. I've worked for companies where um, people throw chairs and they have meetings for teach how people argue. Um, it's a very inviting, welcoming contribute a community. We want everybody to contribute. We realize that everybody from all um, groups should contribute. It makes the whole project better. So we're very welcoming and very open and very honest to that. Nobody should ever feel um, upset about contributing. Nobody should ever be yelled at. If they are, talk to us. We have ways to handle this type of stuff. So I hope that the old idea of a harsh community is long gone. We don't have any recent issues or anything that I know of as far as how that goes. So please, I hope that's not an issue anymore. Um, anything else? Rust in the kernel. Yeah, it's nice. I have my Rust books back there. Um, maybe we'll get there. The funny thing about Rust is like, oh, we'll just write a driver in Rust and that'll be easy. People don't realize that drivers actually are a consumer of more in kernel APIs than anything else. It's the very tip of the tree. We rely on everything for a driver. Um, memory management, process communication, reference counting, driver model, all that jazz. To write a driver is you means you have to have hooks for everything. Um, the last patch that just got sent out looks really good. There's we're gonna talk about it again at the plumbers conference in a few weeks, um, and at kernel summit in a few weeks. Um, I think it's a idea. It's a nice idea. Let's try it and see. My knowledge of Rust is very bad, um, so I need to ramp up on that if I'm gonna try and review patches in that. But sure, why not try it? Um, the fun thing is the majority of our bugs are not issues that Rust would help with. Um, it would um, help for out of tree modules, out of tree drivers, but our development process and our review process and our testing process usually catch the most obvious issues that the Rust model also catches. It's not gonna catch any logic issues and because logic issues are, are possible to you can write bugs in any, any programming language. So the number of bugs it's going to prevent over time might be pretty low. Um, nobody's going to convert old code to this new stuff. I mean, the number of problems that we find are like really, really old drivers that nobody uses anymore, or like the Sega Dreamcast CD-ROM driver, memory leak on the init probe, on uh, init sequence. You know, those things are not really an issue, but those are fixed up. Yes, Rust would have caught that, but we're not going to go port that old code to Rust. And new code ever submitted would never have had that bug in the first. So yeah, look at it. Look at the patches. Run them yourself. See if you think it looks good or not. So uh, let us know if you want to see this stuff. That's the best thing to do. Um, bum, bum, bum. How confident when there are only the two of us to back point hundreds of commits, different version, different code base? Is it enough to trust only the test reports? Um, why wouldn't I trust test reports? So remember, the only patches that go into the stable kernel have already been through this whole review, whole development, whole integration, whole test all retest, all this test process, all the only patches we take into stable are also have passed through all that. So by virtue of that, it's a known good patch. I trust the reviewers and the maintainers of that subsystem to accept that patch and it be correct. Or I trust them if it is wrong, they'll fix it, which is also most important. We're always gonna have bugs. So yes, I trust that first off, that is a good patch. Then we integrate it and we backport everything. And away we go. We run the tests again. We actually run more tests than we run on Linus's tree to verify that everything still works. Sometimes we will find bugs that the original testing, the original bug fix in Linus's tree never found, which is great. That shows the process is working. Then that's why more people are now testing Linus's tree and getting verification. Uh, but yes, I rely on tests. Why wouldn't we rely on the testing procedure? The interesting thing is we test these as a unit. We test all these patches together. We don't test them. We don't cherry pick them out. You cannot just cherry pick random patches out of the stable tree into your device and expect to have a secure and bug-free device. I have done reports on, I will call out, a number of uh, hardware vendors that did Android kernels that did ship devices. And they said, oh no, we just pick out the patches that we know we need. And they missed tons and tons of CVEs. They missed, the best one was they missed a bug 
They missed a commit in the stable tree. They said, this is a bug. Here's the reproducer. Here's how we're fixing this. In the change log text, their tools missed that. So just take everything. And also we test everything as a unit. So look at the larger complex bug fixes we've had with rep bleeds, spectrum meltdown. It's not just a cherry pick. It's about 20 patches. It's about 60 patches. It's about more patches the next release. It's about more patches the next release after that because we find more corner cases. I mean, rep bleed was a number of what, 80, 90 patches. And then with the next few more days, we found 10 more patches. And I just saw a patch flow by today to fix another corner case of this type of stuff. Um, now we can't really test when we do have these zero day issues. And that's another problem that we're trying to work out and, and come to grips with because we can't test in public issues that are private. Um, but it shows that the process works and you can't just share it. So yes, I feel good about the tests that happen. And also you should test. You should never trust a one line patch that you shouldn't run through your whole test system anyway. So the best verification and trust is if you run it under your use case, and you feel that it works for you. That's the best thing to do. So test it yourself. So if I may add one thing. Um, yes, please. So sometimes the one-line fixes are the ones that could really mess things up. So you want to test those, right? Yeah, it's, it's, that's very true. Yeah, you're, you're right. There's a lot of one-line <laughs> fixes that are just flat out wrong. Right. Um, and the other <laughs> thing is the, the, the trust we put in our uh, code that we develop is that I am running 5.9 right now, uh, 19 right now, 5.19 latest. Oh, yeah. And I would have gone to 6.0 RC1 and I would as soon as it comes up. So I am actually doing this webinar on uh, the latest bits. So that's how much I trust all of my, all of my uh, systems I use. They always run the latest RC. So this so, one, this is running on 5.19 as well. Exactly. Plus the USB development stack. <laughs> so right. the stuff that's in Linux tree. So it's running a merge that is even crazier than that. Yeah. And my test, my build system that I run is usually runs the latest, always okay. the latest stuff as well, because I want to verify that my build system can still run. So, Thank you. Yeah. Run yeah. Linux tree. It's, it, plus your own patches. That's the best thing to do. Uh, what about the best factor of Linus? Um, ask him about that. He famously says he's not going to be around. He doesn't care. Um, that being said, the core kernel developers, we have talked about this. We can handle this. We have a process in place. Don't worry about it. We, we know what to do. Um, it's not going to be an issue. There isn't a best factor today. A number of people have right access to Linus's tree today. So it's not a number of people have right access to my tree as well. So um, we all share maintainership of subsystems and major portions of the kernel among each other. So it's not going to be an issue. No, don't worry about it. Any activities using AI and ML? Yes, actually, Sasha, uh, the other stable kernel maintainer, famously is using this. Um, he runs all the kernel patches through a model that says based on and trains it with kernel fixes. So these are fixes that stable or that maintainers say are a fix. And then he compares this other new, new patch with what his current one was. Or it, it does that match or not? And he famously has trained this model. He, with some researchers in academia who wrote a bunch of good papers on this stuff, uh, they went down some wrong paths with this, but it's working pretty well now. Um, again, academic works with us as well. He trains it. So he sends out these patches, he'll say auto select. Um, and these are patches that his tool has found that he thinks should be actually backported because a number of subsystems another of in the kernel do not tag fixes because for various reasons. So those are like very good. But even I've had patches flow by that I forgot to tag as a stable fix. And yeah, oh yeah, that was. And this tool picks it up and it works really well. So um, yes, we have machine learning um, working on the kernel for the past five years that way, making yourself have a much more stable kernel. Um, so yes, that's it uh, for testing. Um, if you look at the work that fuzzers do, you can look at that as pattern matching. I mean, all machine learning is pattern matching. The syspot work is fuzzing the kernel like crazy. Um, that's a whole bunch of the machine and throwing a lot of machine um, processing power, fuzzing patterns, seeing how things work. And we find all the bugs at this layer. It drops down another layer. We find the bugs in that layer. Keep on going. That's been going on for a long time. If you want to bug, you want to get involved in kernel development, and you moved on beyond fixing up a coding style issue or changing the spelling of a word. So now that you know how to develop, process, you know how the process works, look at the syspot list of bugs. We have hundreds of bugs out there that are reported. Here's a reproducer, run this, fix the problem. 
they're they're there and they're doing a great job of finding these issues i wish they did a better job on providing the resources to fix them that being said we have the mentor and the intern project to help provide resources to fix this stuff we have she was running a bunch of interns this year this round um, to help fix these problems i've done it in the past as well she's doing a wonderful job with that and i highly recommend that but if you want to get involved please do it so yes there's your ai and ml again ai and ml is just statistics it's nothing fancy statistics at a large level I have to probably make some people mad. That's okay. Cool. Yes, thanks for linking this. this um, and the fun thing is, we have seen security bugs reported to us. This happened this week. We're like, oh, here's a security bug in this area of the kernel. And we dug, and are like, oh, yeah, this bot reported that a year ago. <laughs> so um, people need to pay more attention to that stuff. And the fun thing is, when this bot has reported something publicly, it makes it easier for us to fix because then we can go look at the bug report back then. We have a reproducer. We can work on the problem in public, fix it, push it out to everybody, and it works even faster than if we were to have to try and do it in private. So we're really happy about that as well. Cool. Still got some more time today. Bug bounty problems for the Linux kernel. Um, the kernel does not run that. We don't offer that. Um, that being said, there are a number of companies that do. I will call out Google is known for paying a very large amount of money to people who find bugs. Google works with us and they want us to fix the problems before. So if you find a bug in the kernel, it's deemed a security problem, we fix it in the kernel, you can then report it to Google and they'll pay you. Works out great. Uh, famously, they uh, I, a number of months ago, there was a bunch of USB gadget bugs that were fixed. And I think I just saw that that, that person got paid an awful lot of money. For fixing those or for, for finding those and I and helping fix those bugs. So sometimes that, that's good. Some people want that and they're I'm glad they're offering that to us. Um Google's very nice in that they also do a lot of triage with that type of stuff. Um so it's good that nobody has to hoard patches or hoard, hoard vulnerabilities and you can get paid by companies like Google. There's a few other companies that also pay for bugs um and then they'll be reported to us, um, which is fine. So but as a kernel community, we don't do that. That's up to you. Um, we don't have any money. We're not a corporation. So, um, if you want to get paid to fix bugs, um, yeah, look at the money. just work with Google. You'll get some, paid some good stuff. Some people are making some good money from that. And then usually Google just hires you. So that's funny to watch. I think they actually have a number of opening in their security team right now because of that. <laughs> Sometimes new features are back, accidentally backported to stable because it, it depends and it changes the behavior we don't want in stable. Any ideas how subsystem maintainers can prevent that? Monitoring the stable mailing list. Um, one thing, if you don't want your, any patches for your subsystem backported to stable except the ones you explicitly mark for stable, let us know. There's a number of subsystems that I've said, we are going to take care of this. We will be the one sending you patches. We will be the one tagging it for you. Do not run them through the auto select. Do not run them through anybody else. We're going to do this. And I'll work with you on that. And that's perfect. I will call out XFS as a file system that is finally getting involved and doing it. But before that, they said no patches for stable. They're doing a good job. They're testing them. They run through the framework. Uh, the KVM maintainer is, does a really, really good job of tagging the right patches for stable. And it says anything that isn't tagged for stable probably shouldn't be going. And then sometimes we question a few, they'll agree with them. So we have a little bit of a manual process where we propose, hey, should these have gone as well? And then they'll say yes, no, yes, no. The memory management team also, if it isn't tagged for stable, and um, it, we just don't accept it unless it goes through those maintainers. So if you're a maintainer of a subsystem that you don't want anything but the stuff that you're going through, talk to me. And talk to software on the mailing list, and we'll be glad to mark those. We have tools that when we scan the patches that we don't even, we just exclude those subsystems as well. That being said, some things backport that do change behavior, which is odd because you just change behavior in Linux tree as well. So why wouldn't you want that change behavior in older kernels now, whether we just didn't take all the patches or it changed in a way that we didn't want to? Great, we'll work with you. Um, we all make mistakes. We all fix up bugs. Great. Uh, we'll just take that and move on. That happens very, very rarely. Um, but you don't have to monitor the, the stable mailing list. We copy anybody involved on the patch when it goes in the stable tree. So if you were involved in the patch in the beginning, you're signed off, you're reviewed by, you're tested by, or whatever's on that, you'll get copied again. So if you happen to see a patch go by, you're like, no, 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 that shouldn't go in there. You're automatically notified. So you don't have to subscribe to the mailing list. We notify you. And we don't copy you, I copy you, people complain I send too much email, 
but it's there. You are notified when patches are added, when patches are up for review, what branch they're added to, what branch they're being merged to. You get lots of email about this type of stuff. So you know what's going on. Um, you don't have to monitor the mailing list. Um, so yeah, so if you don't want your subsystem having patches, talk to me and um, we'll work through it and figure out a way to it. Do you automatically do security testing with fuzzing tools? So Sysbot does a lot of testing. Um, again, a kernel, a bug in the kernel is a bug is a bug. Whether that's a security issue or not is not for me to decide. People have done some really cool things and shown that like a one byte overflow was a security issue through this long, arduous chain, but we fixed it up and moved it on anyway. And that's our goal, fix up the bug and move on. So we do fuzzing tools. Yes, yeah, Sysbot's a huge, wonderful fuzzing tool. Um, there was another fuzzing tool that we used to run all the time uh, from Dave Jones. I can't remember the name of it. It still runs as well. Um, Coconut, we have tons of static analysis tools that run on the, on the tree. Um, um, even the other, the page, Coverity. Coverity runs on the tree. You can see all those bug reports. So we have lots of tools that run to find out security issues or find out bugs and fix them. So yes, we do a lot of that. That's the Trinity, I guess, the one. Trinity, the yes, one. thank yes. you. <laughs> And that's still running. I still see reports from every once in a while. Dave Jones does a really good job. He actually, he's still around, um, which is cool. Um, kernel books are old. Do I have any plans to write any more new books? Um, excuse me, no, Riley. I wrote the Linux Driver book, or the third edition contributed to it. Um, Riley said, no, we don't want to do books anymore. So no, they don't want that to happen. They won't give us a copyright back. Um, that being said, there are a number of good books. You can look at the, uh, the O'Reilly books uh, for the kernel. Rather books for the drivers to get the ideas uh, and to get the idea and then look at the code from the ideas to see how the implementation works today. They still hold up well. I know the driver book is still used in universities for teaching the basics about writing drivers. The memory management book is still as well. Robert Love has a good book that's still the basics of how a kernel works is really well. But even roll back even further, look at Tannenbaum's book on Minix, which is what I learned from and what Linus learned from. They happen to do it at the same time. Um, that book is written at the University of right the Street here. Um, that's a really good book on operating system design and implementation and those ideas and those work from there still pertain today. Um, you'll see the old way of doing things with the POSIX model and the old Unix models in the kernel, but we've also moved way beyond that for a number of things. We do high-speed IO, we do all these other fancy interfaces. Uh, but yeah, so look at the old books, they work really well. The networking books from Stevens work really good well for networking basics. And then look at how the kernel handles things today um, because we've evolved beyond those. Keeping that up to date with the book is probably not worth the time. You don't make any money writing a book. It's a lot of effort and work. Um, that being said, people have kept, I know the device driver book examples. Um, a professor, I think at the University of Florida, um, has keep those up to date on GitHub. So they do work and build on all the latest kernels. So you can do that. You can do that. So no, no more plans for any new books for now. I still have to read these Rust books and get through those. Yet, so. Cool. So we do oh, have- Stress uh... MG is kind of interesting. That, that really just stresses your hardware more than anything else. Right. What I found. I don't think it stresses the kernel. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't stress, you are right, it doesn't stress the kernel as much. Uh, they do have like a few new features, MM testing, that they seem to do. Um, yeah, some things are good. Something weird, I mean, if you talk to the file system people, they're like, yeah, we have to run these tests for 10,000 hours in order to make sure they work, which is, seems very non-deterministic to me. And very it's odd, the like file a... system's interactions with tests are very odd too, so. Absolutely. It's more like a chore test, meaning continuous also hours of operation type test. You have to wait a long time to make sure yeah. um, that it works. Um, but yes, um, so that's another thing. And then if you're looking for Rust resources, um, this web webinar mentorship series already has three of them and we are yeah. planning two more. So check it out. Um, Redson um, and Miguel, uh, Rust developers, they have been um, doing, they are coming to, they came to me and they wanted to host, um, volunteer their time to put mentorship, uh, webinars, uh, yeah, on Rust. And yeah, 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 you have, you have, uh, two more coming up. There's already three on there on this mentorship. Cool, cool thing is what they also did is they made a, a GPIO driver in C and GPIO driver in Rust right next to each other. And you can lay it down who, how this works and, and, what. and that's a great, great learning tool. And that helped me out a lot. Um, as somebody who knows C. And I think that they went through that on the device driver talk, right? 
Mm -hmm. for... Yeah, that's the, they they designed the three part series that way to to yeah. go through and show you how to write a new driver and then uh, um, and then also be able to yeah to compare uh, what is in the kernel and then uh, what can be done with, how you po do that same thing in the Rust and yes. then so that those are those if you are interested in Rust check those out there is already two up three up there and then two more coming up later on this year. So, no more questions. Awesome. We'll give 15 minutes back to everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, I think I need to throw it back to the Linux Foundation admin. Yes, thank you so much, Greg. And thank you, Shua, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today, and a copy of the presentation slides will be added to the Linux Foundation website. We hope you are able to join us for future mentorship sessions and have a wonderful day.